Mike Milken this morning was kind enough to say that uh, we were talking about biomes. You know, he's very interested in, in medical research, as you all know. And he was saying that, that the judges who hand out sentences after lunch, they hand out a lot more lenient sentences. So I said, thanks for giving me the panel right before lunch then, right? So, but uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Louisa Boyerson. I work for CNBC. I'm an anchor. So, uh, so I cover anything that moves the markets. Uh, many of us we've met uh, last year uh, at the uh, last year's Milken Conference. And we had a fantastic discussion last year, and I'm hoping to continue it this year. Um, I'll introduce my panelists in, in just a second. Um, I would just say before that, uh, that a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about here would have been uh, uh, mirrored over from other panels. So we might just try to switch it up a little bit and take some new perspectives. Um, and Europe is a mess. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time now. Uh, at the height of the financial crisis, the excuse seemed to be that uh, Europe was a political project. And that's why we couldn't solve some of these financial issues, because Europe was a political project. And now it seems we have a political crisis or political crises, depending on which ones you're looking at. And we still can't solve anything. So how do we move ahead? Um, in terms of Europe, I mean, Mike Milken last night is the master of throwing out, and this morning, I interviewed him this morning as well, the master of throwing out all these facts. And when looking at Europe, you have approximately 12% of the world's population living in Europe, around 775 million people, a little bit less. Asia making up 60% of the world's population, China and India, 37%, Africa, 15%, North America, around 5%. So just again, keeping that in mind when we talk about migration. And I think it's interesting to think about how short our memories are. I mean, it's just a, a couple of decades ago, really, that you saw refugees from Greece ending up in Syria. Uh, having to be hosted in Aleppo, uh, being helped also by the Americans at that stage. And now it's a completely reversed situation that we're in. Um, Thomas Friedman, like him or hate him, up to you, in one of his books uh, talks about how the future is unpredictable. He says, be practical, expect the impossible. And he basically summarizes the last century, interestingly, in 20-year chunks, just as a reminder that, that we think that whatever we're going through now is going to last a very, very, very long time. Some things might, but many things might not. So he talks about how, in his book, that we're very globalized in the 1900s, the beginning of the 1900s. We come off the back of British and French colonization. 1920, the aftermath of World War I, uh, US had risen to power. 1940, of course, Germany was coming right along and rose to power very quickly, gaining dominance. In 1960, a completely different story. It was very much the US that, uh, that, that was holding dominance at that point. 1980, you had the rising Soviet dominance. And then in 2000, we thought, well, now it's really all about globalization. Then 9-11 happened, and here we go, starting all over again. So it's very interesting to look at some of the things, I was thinking this morning, listening to some of the other panels, thinking about what's going on in our world now and what will happen over the next 20 years, what will happen over the next 20 years in Europe. And speaking of Europe, that's what our panel is about, the future of the EU, union or dissolution. Let me introduce my panel here next to me. Uh, I have Nigel Farage, and uh, you know him well. Um, Nigel Farage, leader of the UK Independence Party and member of the European Parliament. Um, to his left, we have Juan Maria Nin Genova, uh, president of the U.S. Spain Council Foundation and former deputy chairman and CEO of Caixa Bank as well. Here to my right, uh, we have Howard Shore, executive chairman of Shore Capital. And out here on the flank as well, last but not least, Peter Bayer, uh, a member of uh, the German Bundestag. And, um, and I thought, listening to some of the comments that were made earlier, that we start with Germany, because uh, one of the comments that was made on an earlier panel was that Germany is never going to invade anybody ever again. Uh, and that, <laughs> what, you, you think they are? <laughs> I'm not going to ask by a poll of hands. <laughs> but, um, but I thought, just in what's going on in Europe now, and whether or not the EU stays together or not, you guys have it tough. We look towards Germany for leadership and you know, Europe's largest economy and all the rest of it. And then when you take a stance and take leadership and say, look, guys, this is what we need to do, then everybody comes down hard on you, whether it's the you know, Greek financial crisis, the Brexit, yes or no, uh, or whether it's uh, migration as well. What do you think Germany's role should be? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for this panel. I think it's a fantastic topic, and as, as, as you pointed out quite rightly in the beginning, it covers, it's, it's, it's a broad approach to, I think, almost everything that is covered in the, in the, in the, in the other panels. Um, the role of Germany and, and nowadays, I mean, economically, it is a very strong country, as you know. And uh, on a, somebody said earlier today in one of the panels that um, Europe, well, Ger Germany and Europe as a whole is politically, it's a, it's a dwarf on a global scale, but economically they're strong. And to some extent I agree, so th this is right to some extent, but focusing on 
Europe and the, the Germany's role, role within the Club of 28, 28 member states uh, within the European Union, um, based on its economic strength, but, but also based on, the, on, its, on its political strength that it has within the European Union, I think it should go ahead and, uh, no, and, 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 and show some political leadership as well, but not alone. If you remember, it is n never a good thing to, that, that one nation steps ahead. At least it should be uh, done together with, with the French, which is not easy, but the German-French axis, let alone the Weimar Triangle, is something so with Poland, in addition to, to France and Germany, is something that could be a core of the European Union. So um, I, while preparing for this, for this conference, I came across a paper going back from to 1994 that was drafted by a now financial minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, that was four years after the uh, reunification of Germany. And there was this idea laid out in, in detail about a European Union of two speeds, which is brought up now in the discussions again and again, and I think there, this is worthwhile discussion, discussing about. So two-speed uh, Europe happening even more at the moment? Is there a way that we can, you know, can well, we, we avoid this? No, I mean, <laughs> if we, well look, I think, um, speaking again of the Club of 28, I think uh, the European Union has grown in the past too fast, probably. And still the enlargement process is going on. There are, especially former Yugoslavian states like uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, they are knocking on the door mm. of the European Union. But, you know, we have to really be aware if now and in the, in, the, in the foreseeable future, like five to ten years, if the European Union is really prepared to digest more member states. Um, so I think you know, if, if you look to the, to the situation as we have it now, in part we have to speed the uh, European Union nowadays already. Uh, you, know, you have the Schengen uh, regime, you have uh, the Eurozone, sure. so this is less than 28 countries. So it's I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's working, mm. but, um, uh, but uh, to some extent we have it already. And politically, um, so talking of a political union, um, I think some of the ideas in the German, French, Polish, maybe Italian axis, uh, you know, they, they, they can bring things uh, mm. forward. Juan Maria, <coughs> let me just bring you in here because I can't help myself because he's talking about this two-speed Europe, and you represent Spain, right? You, you, you maybe represent some of the periphery markets. He represents the core, you know, periphery. Um, you have a banking background. We spoke earlier this morning on air, and you said something like, it's game over for Europe right now. Oh. Why, why is it game over? Yeah. This is true. I said uh, game over, and then I added uh, perhaps the match, but I do not know. But the game is over. Um, when I say the game is over, I am biased by the fact that uh, I was 25 years old when I was the youngest member of the uh, uh, negotiated, uh, negotiating team in Spain that uh, uh, went into the accession to the EC. We negotiated for two years and all of us were enthusiastic. Of course, we had a prolific amount and we had to wait, as the UK did for 10 years, we wait six years in between 1980 in 1986, when finally we had two socialist governments in France and Spain, and we finally exited. Greece came in in 1981, mm -hmm. and when we asked what's going on, what they said is, this is a small problem. You could be a big problem. So this is for history, you know? And I am biased very much in favor of the uh, European Union. And I have been attending the European and using the European Union, which for Spain, I hope for Europe, has been fundamental. But I say that the game is over uh, for three reasons, and then I can elaborate on the three if you wish. The first one is multilateralism. I think, uh, and this is the external factor. I do think Europe is uh, making a big mistake with multilateralism. I do not think this is the appropriate external policy. I think blocks are much more effective, and we must constitute a block, and the practice of multilateralism is a permanent fiasco. Uh, you can see the European positions in respect of the Arab Spring or Ukraine or trade agreements with Japan or now the TTIP. So external factors are not good for uh, the European Union as it is now. Then we have an internal factor, which is a reputation shock. I do think the last elections in, in Europe have been 
not good. I think ideology is moving to populism. I think the values with which we built up what we are now in the present moment are not working at all. We, have, we are moving our population to other values. And this reputation uh, shock is moving into the uh, incapacity of Europe to have real European leaders. Member states have taken the protagonism mm -hmm. from European institutions, and this is going to kill any capacity of Europe to bring in real European leaders. Mm -hmm. The game is in between member states once again. And this reputation shock could lead us, and I do think that for the first time this is possible, to a black swan. In the sense, Taleb defines a black swan. So if there is a shock, uh, this will be a terrible shock. And what, what would the shock be? What would the black swan look like? Uh, it looks very black, and I hope <laughs> I, <laughs> everybody, everybody knows uh, Taleb and the black swan. No? But uh, these external and internal uh, problems we do have can lead us to a black swan. And external and internal factors move into, as a banker, the core issue. And the core issue for me in uh, the present European Union is risk mutualization. My job has been dealing with risk. And I do think that uh, the scope of risk in between the 28 members, I think it's 28 or 30 or 35, it doesn't matter, so many members, it is impossible. There is no way to mutualize risk in mm. Europe because the differences in between the countries uh, more specifically, economic mm. differences and cultural differences are so sure. huge that this risk materialization, uh, I can assure you, is not possible. So sure. this means that the cornerstone of the next step, if we want to bring in a real European Union, yeah. and the cornerstone is, just one second for the concept of, yes. of, of materialization, is, uh, the cornerstone is uh, the banking union and the fiscal union with these differences of risk, this will not take place. And if it does not take place, and added to this, we do not have European debt, we have municipal debt, as US people like to say, next steps uh, building up Europe, uh, I think are not possible. So the game is over, we have to rethink in a new Europe, or at least two, three, or four uh, different velocity, okay. velocities for Europe. Okay. Speech. Well, nice meeting you. It seems that we can go home now. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, it doesn't look very, it doesn't look very optimistic, uh, Howard. It looks, uh, it looks pretty bleak. Are you as bleak as this? I'm bleak about the prospects of uh, Europe unless we reform. Um, but the biggest factor to me is the social welfare in Europe. Whether we have an EU structure, we don't have an EU structure whether it's two speed or one speed. If you even just look at the refugee crisis today, um, when my ancestors came <coughs> to the country, they were coming as uh, immigrants to seek a safer life and a better life. But you can be absolutely sure that if they didn't quickly learn to speak English and find work, they would have starved. Today, you can come and the welfare system provides a support mechanism where people won't starve and they don't have to assimilate. It's just one example. In, in this country, the government have made a pretty good effort in terms of changing the risk reward from work and welfare to make it harder to access welfare and a better incentive to work by cutting tax. The problem in Europe is that we have this excessive regulation and a welfare system where too many people are working to feed too many, and that's going to get worse with an <coughs> aging population. So whatever the structure, Europe needs to change to become more dynamic with less regulation to compete on a global basis. Vis-a-vis -vis the EU, I think most people in the room know it's a failed structure. But the question is, can it reform at all? And I think it probably can a bit. Um, and I actually think that uh, the UK has got quite an important role to play in that. Um, in, in no small part down to Nigel and his efforts to um, promote a referendum. There is a high level of uncertainty whether the UK stays or goes. Mm. Uh, I happen to think we'll stay, even though I think we should go, because I think the Prime Minister will tell everybody that he's negotiated a deal and we should stay. 
Nigel will probably disagree. But my, my, view, my, my, my view of the outcome is that when Prime Minister and the Chancellor come and say, I've got a deal, my recommendation to the British public is to stay, we will stay. But in the meantime, we've got a great opportunity to really turn up the heat on Europe. We just heard that the Germans dominate um, and that uh, with the French axis, they pretty much control things. So mm. this idea that you've got to get 26 people to agree, or 28 people to agree, I don't, I don't think is actually true. Angela Merkel, I'm sorry to say, is in an incredibly weak position today compared to a few months ago. First of all, the Greek crisis we talked about, you said there wouldn't be a third bailout in LA. Mm -hmm. I said there would. Then you've got... Um, <laughs> Well, then, 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 then well Peter, voted, Peter voted yes twice and then no. He said he wouldn't support it, yeah, but I said she'd push it through. So they've got the, she's got to admit to the German public that she got it wrong on Greece at some stage and that they're not going to they're gonna not pay a proportion of the debt. Now they've got a slowdown in Chinese exports. They've got the Ukrainian issue and yeah. Russian sanctions. And now they've got to pay for the refugees. It's inconceivable that she would allow a situation to go to the German public and say, I allowed Britain to go. We've got to make up the fiscal transfer. Mm. By the way, your car industry, by the way, the car industry, I'm sorry, we messed it up. Can you imagine the strength of the German lobby for Britain mm. to stay in when they really understand that we might leave? So we can put a lot of pressure for Europe to improve and to reform. Not to the level that I would like to see, but it can change a bit for the better if the government take a strong line. I want to come back to the issue of Germany and the pressure to be put on Germany potentially or, or, or not. Yeah. Um, but before that, Nigel, yeah. um, what is it exactly that you would like to see? And, and, and if, we have to, if we have to remain in the EU, what would a new treaty look like? Uh, the, the, this concept of reform is baloney. You know, I mean, I was, I was in Strasbourg last week. Uh, we had a visit from Mrs. Merkel, who, when she shook my hand, looked even more miserable than she normally does. Um, we had the pipsqueak Hollande there. Um, and, and, of course, the... Well, you know, 25 years ago, Cole and Mitterrand were political equivalents. Now, uh, France has just diminished before our very eyes, and we're living... It's ironic, isn't it, that the project that was set up, uh, because basically people feared... Uh, that the Germans would militarise again and for a fourth time uh, invade. Uh, I don't believe that was ever, ever a prospect. I think post-1945 Germany was never, getting back to where we started this conversation, was ever, ever uh, going to invade anybody. Uh, but it is a supreme irony that one of the main aims of the European project was to contain Germany, uh, and now what Mrs Merkel says goes. Um, so they were both there in the Parliament, and they were talking about reform. Um, and reform for Monsieur Hollande is that we have a full foreign policy and military policy without national vetoes and a European army. And reform for Angela Merkel um, is much more strength and power for the central European institutions. Indeed, last night uh, there was a book launch in Brussels, which mercifully I wasn't at, um, led by Guy Verhofstadt, the former Belgian Prime Minister. Every cartoon is dream, that bloke, he really is. Um, and he's launched his book on behalf of the European Liberal Party, and his reform is that all national vetoes must go as quickly as possible. So when we talk about the word reform, reform is being talked about in Brussels every single day, and reform is more Europe. They say we, everything we've done's failed, therefore we need more of the same. It's reminiscent, actually, um, of the Soviets that the more their policies failed, the more they concluded what we need is more communism. So when we hear Brits talking about a change of direction, uh, frankly, uh, to put it politely, we're whistling in the wind. Uh, there is no reform. Um, there, is a, there is a nationalist fanaticism behind the European Union. You know, it has a flag, it has an anthem, it has a police force, it wants an army, um, it wants to expand you know, the former Commission President, Mr. Barroso, said we are, we are a, a non-military empire. Um, it's pretty clear it wants to flex its muscles um, in terms of foreign policy. We've seen that uh, through the Ukraine and through the quite deliberate provocation of Putin, whatever we think of him. 
Um, and there is a paradox, and I've seen this. You know, I've been in there for 16 years, and I remember when the European Constitution, the French voted no, the Dutch overwhelmingly voted no, and I really thought, I thought, that's it. We've changed it. They're now going to start giving back a few powers. They're going to start listening to the people. But the opposite happened. They rebranded it as the Lisbon Treaty and pushed it through. And the paradox is, at the moment, the more the project fails, so the migrant crisis, Merkel's disastrous uh, call for everybody to come to Europe, regardless of who they were, when you've got opposition from Hungary, from Slovakia, from Poland, from Romania, uh, what happened? They used a trick uh, within the European Commission to force those countries against their will to take mandatory quotas. So that's the paradox. The more it fails, the more power it accrues. Um, I think the British referendum is not just an absolutely fundamental moment for this country, but I think actually it's a fundamental moment for the whole of the European project. If Britain votes to leave, and I would say I think it's 50-50, right at the moment. I genuinely think it's 50-50. If Britain votes to leave and shows within a year to 18 months that actually you don't need to be part of political union to buy and sell motor cars from each other, then I think you'll see countries like Austria, countries like Sweden, um, whose political parties will start to want the same thing. So my hope is that Britain votes uh, to withdraw from political union, uh, and that is the beginning of the end of a project that nobody in Europe has ever asked for or ever wanted, and that we, re and that we replace the nationalism of the EU uh, by going back to that building in Strasbourg that was built in 1948. It was called the Council of Europe, and we can all sit round as civilised European countries around the table and agree on things that we agree on. But it's funny that you talk about European nationalism, because mm. I think many might think, well, actually, it's... it's, it's individual country nationalism that's springing up. I mean, we're, we're erecting borders made out of razor blades, some might say at the well, moment, and borders have become a negotiating pawn as well. You know, Germany saying, well, look, you know, you don't want to take in uh, refugees or migrants, Poof, we're, we're putting back our border, even though, you know, we have the Schengen Agreement in place. Right? Yeah, we have seen national interests begin to come to the fore again, um, you know, through the crisis of the Euro and the crisis of the uh, migrant, uh, of, of, of the migrant problem. But, but, but be in no doubt, you know, when they play that anthem, in the Parliament, you know, they all stand there, ramrod strong. I don't, but, <laughs> you know, I cross my legs and whistle Colonel Bogey, you know, but, <laughs> but, 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 no, 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 I mean, I mean, I mean, they, I mean they, just, they are building a state, be yeah, in no doubt. But, Nigel, can I just say, you just said, what, you just said, you yep. just said what your hope is, and I share yep. your hope that we uh, would leave and other people would follow, but I'm suggesting that your hope won't turn into reality because my prediction is we stay. And what I can see, and Peter brought up, is the opportunity to accentuate a two-speed EU where uh, people not in the Eurozone uh, have ability to opt out on all <coughs> sorts of issues. If the government's tough, we can increase the range of issues that we can opt out from. And eventually, you might get some people say, you know what? The UK route is slightly more attractive than the uh, core route, and we might find that the Europe develops in a different way as a result of this referendum, even well, if Britain doesn't leave. It, Notwithstanding it, the fact that I think it would be better if we left. What you've just said. I would be interested in your. I mean, you. So I'm quite shocked about everything that we were uh, talking about, you're describing everything bad, and you know, it failed. The Europe, concept of the European Union has failed. Well, it's never, I mean, actually, no, it's no, never, it has not. Who, I mean, have, who have you, ever consented to have it? You, have, who have ever you, consented to it? So what do you think, how, how would the European state that make up now the Club of 28, what do you think, um, you know, the, 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 the state of, the, of these countries would be nowadays? I mean, isn't it true that it has is a guarantor for peace and stability on the old continent? So far, so isn't that a success? Haven't you forgotten about something called NATO? Haven't you forgotten yeah. about the nuclear deterrent? The idea that a few political failures in Brussels so have tell kept me, the peace for 60 tell years me about your is not something I subscribe to at all. Yes. And, and so the idea of variable geometry in Europe, you know, what Howard's described is <clears> exactly <throat> the trick that Cameron's going to pull. Cameron will come back. He won't have renegotiated or reformed anything. But he, that's he, that's but an he exaggeration. Will, He'll do something. What, what, He's got to do what, something, what, Nigel. He's got to do unless something. Unless you change the treaties, well, unless you change the treaties, yeah. fundamental reform is not possible. 
changing a European treaty takes longer than, than turning round a tanker. Mm. It would take three to four years from this moment mm. to change the European and treaties. The but what he will do... I'll come back to but, you on that. But what he will do, he will come <laughs> back and say, yeah. we now have associate status. Yeah. The Eurozone is going to integrate more deeply yeah. and move ahead, yeah. but we're OK because we have associate... Let all me just, let me just get all the that means Peter's is we'll point. be where we are now. Peter? Yeah, I would be interested just, just to ask you this question. What is, um, I mean, if the, the referendum goes through, or whether, whether, whether the, 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 the UK wants to get out of the European Union, what is your concept for the, not only the political, but also the economic future? If, if think, think about the young generation. Do so you think they're better off outside of the, um, isn't there sure. isolation? No, it's not isolation. isolation. It's Normality. I think it will be isolated. No, I think it's not. It's, not. it's, 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 it's taking away the, the it's regulation. It's, 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 it's getting out of a, a, a structure which is over-regulated and over-protective into a more flexible economic environment. So, so I agree to some extent, but what, <coughs> why not? So I, I, where I do not agree is that you know, we look at the European Union as it now, it's dysfunctional, it's not, not, not working, so let's get back out of it. So that's too simple. It's a very, very simple and easy uh, uh, approach to this uh, problem that, that, I, that I agree is there. Mm. But shouldn't we put some effort in reforming? They said, yes, we need, and, and I totally we agree. If Merkel and Alonso said, mm. we, need more, we need more Europe, we need to reform the institution, more legal, uh, more, more uh, direct democracy. Yes, and this comes with a transfer of sovereignty to Brussels or to Strasbourg or whatever, wherever. If you believe in stability and sure. peace and, sure. and, and the peaceful concept and in economic strength, yeah. given, given the, the, the fact, although that, that there's a, the, 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 the economies uh, within the 28 member states are, are different, mm. but if you believe then that you can develop this further, and I strongly believe that it is worth the effort, Okay. Then you should and you need to do this. Juan Maria, and not just worth the back effort, up. not worth the effort? Yes, it's uh, too easy. May I use your paradox? I'm very yeah. much interested in it, which <coughs> brings me closer to my uh, problem with risk no? and risk mutualization. Um, as far as I see it, uh, we are at the present moment, because I, I agree with you, but at the present moment we are surrounded by fragile states. We do have a very important energy problem in, in Europe as a whole with uh, Russia at this particular moment. We do not have growth uh, drivers. Uh, population is stagnating. Uh, there is no growth and quality of life is diminishing. So at the end, what I'm saying is the international situation is a very difficult one at this particular moment. And added to this, uh, the future depends very much on the economic situation. Normally, I think, bad politics drive in bad economics. But in the present situation, it is bad economics, bad economics, the ones that are going to bring in bad politics in, in Europe. And uh, one of the fundamental reasons that makes uh, the uh, next steps incompatible is, are these bad economics, and uh, which bring in populism. So. With your paradox, the international situation, uh, bad economics uh, bringing in this, and the necessity we have to turn around the financial situation and bring in to Europe once again capital and savings, and no more quantitative easing, and no more liquidity, and no more financial decisions, unless, which is my final point, we come into the next step uh, back to several similar or capable European members of the Union and leave the rest to do their homework mm -hmm. on a second, third or fourth velocity or the whole of the system mm -hmm. will collapse. Once again, game is over. And now it is not a question of risk, it is a question of economics, which of course, I repeat my argument, will influence politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, why, why not try the reform first? Why not try? Because we've been trying for 40 years. But well, we haven't. I mean, to, to renegotiate a new treaty, renegotiate a new single. treaty. Well, this time around, renegotiate a new treaty yeah. first, and then after, you know, yeah. see if it, how it works, how it goes, and then after a couple of years, then have a referendum. Why every do it now? single general election since 1974, every prime minister contesting it and every leader of the opposition against it has promised fundamental reform of the common fisheries policy, the common agricultural policy. Uh, Blair launched into a grand renegotiation, which finished up with us getting stuffed for seven billion on the rebate for nothing in return. Look, we, I think we're missing the point here. There is a bigger picture here. The European Union is a political union. 
It has a flag, an anthem. Its courts are supreme over all of our national courts. Nobody in this country ever, ever voted for that. Nobody in Germany ever, ever voted for that. And what you've seen are the peoples of Europe have been corralled into a political state without ever giving it consent. I don't want to make the European Union better. I have no interest in that flag, that anthem. I don't want a European army. And I think the British Parliament and British courts should be sovereign. It's as simple as that. But So my problem is that I, I genuinely do not know what will happen if we leave. Well, I, all I, around I the world. Don't know. Okay, all it, around the world. It might be better well, it, and it might I, be worse. Can I, can I say what, uh, what no. uh, a few million entrepreneurs said in, in, in the yes, UK. Yes, we spoke it's about it, the, the, the study. Yeah, look, yeah. look we, 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 we commissioned a study on what SMEs think of uh, the EU. Uh, they represent 60% of the private sector workforce and created 68% of all new jobs over the last five years. By two for one, they said the EU hinders rather than helps their business, two for one. 80% said bring employment legislation and health and safety legislation back to UK jurisdiction. And nearly half said that they'd either pay people more money and or employ more people if we weren't part of the EU. So what the business people are saying is this system is a major hindrance to our success. Now, they're the engine of employment. What's the biggest problem in Europe today? <laughs> is unemployment. It's a tragedy for the youth of today. We were talking about it in Spain, the level of unemployment. They can't get a job. We've created two million jobs, actually, in the UK over the last five years. So it's been a much better, probably as many jobs as the rest of the EU uh, put together. And but nearly all the jobs have come from SMEs. So we need to create an environment where these SMEs can thrive and give people employment. So my focus is on how can we improve the economic performance of Europe? How can we get people off the unemployment register, out of welfare, and back to work? Because the middle class are getting too squeezed, and they feel very uncomfortable about it. And we're seeing that at every level. We're even, even in Germany, I've spent a lot of time in Germany recently, um, I've noticed that the, the, there's a sea change in people's attitudes towards the refugee crisis. Four weeks ago, all the um, educated uh, middle class people that I met said, oh, it's fantastic, we're doing the right thing. And, and now they're saying, now they're saying, hmm, not sure about this, it's going to cost a lot of money. So it could create right wing elements because of the financial pressures. Mm. And in, we need to ease the financial pressures by better economic performance and we need to get people back to work. So it's, it's nice to have ideals. But, but the man in the street needs to have a, a decent standard of living. It's also, you could argue, and this goes along the lines of what, what was being talked about at, at last, uh, last night's migration panel as well. I mean, it's pathetic, the difference between Germany almost taking in a million people who need a place to go, you know, who need to get away from, from their homes, and, and Britain taking in 20,000. Well, I'll give you a very good... No, 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 Lisa, uh, that's very unfair. First of all, Germany's got a... a Ger Germany's got a demographic problem. It's got a declining population. Ours is increasing rapidly. We're set to go from 60 to 80 million. They're set to go from 80 to 60 million. Secondly, obviously, um, the sentiment in Germany and the constitution of Germany is affected by what happened in the war and their attitude towards taking refugees generally. Uh, and thirdly, unfortunately, we're the major recipient of Eastern European migration as a result of the EU law which allows people to freely come to the UK and because we're the largest job creator, people want to come here. So we're getting hundreds of thousands of people coming from within the EU and therefore we can't easily do the right thing for refugees. We should be doing more. But our, our immigration policy is flawed because but we these, can't control the number people, of people. I mean, come. in Germany and other countries as well. Sorry, but these people that you're talking about from East, uh, East, East Eastern Europe are coming to other countries, including yes, but, Germany as well. But the largest proportion are coming to the, the UK <coughs> because they can get a job. We're a small island, and we can't control the level of immigration from the EU. So two terrible things: a consequence. Number one, we can't get the smart brains who would like to come here 
from outside the EU. That's our biggest loss. And we also can't do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis the refugee crisis. Um, Peter, I know you have something yeah. wrong at your point. I also <coughs> just want to ask you just to tell us about uh, TTIP and the, and the big, uh, um, you were saying there's a big uh, um, <coughs> demonstration that yeah. happened here, here last, uh, last if week. If you allow me, we'll, 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 just one, one sentence yeah. to the, to the, to the uh, immigration issue, the refugee issue. Um, this is totally different because Howard was mentioning, you know, people now are now realizing, well, the refugees, they cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is about that, they, that it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, you know, the salvation of, of, of Greece was also, you know, it was also costly. And people were upset, they didn't like it, but it was very abstract for, for, uh, for them. They didn't really feel it, and so they were still staying wealthy and everything was fine. But uh, the, the 800,000, a million people coming just this year to Germany, the refugees, they can see them on the streets in their neighborhood. So this is very concrete, this is real. This, is, this has a completely different quality than the Greece uh, issue. So this is something, and you're absolutely right, the, 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 you know, the situation, the, the sentiment within the society is shifting now to the, to the <laughs> negative side, or at least people are wondering, hmm, can we really cope with the situation? What are we going to do? And but now coming, yep. With TTIP, yeah. That, TTIP, um, it, yeah. It surprised me. You told me this morning there's something like 150,000 you know, people have I been mean, demonstrating against this, this trade absolutely. deal. Absolutely. Last Saturday in Berlin, we had at least 100,000 people on the streets demonstrating against it. The organizers were saying it was 250,000 was just one of these uh, demonstrations that we had over the past one and a half, two years against this free trade zone. Um, and th this is exceptional within the European Union that in Germany there's so much anti-TTIP um, uh, movement uh, you know, for, for various reasons, but um, people are afraid about lower, lowering standards with regard to environmental standards, uh, labor standards, uh, and these things, which is not going to happen because we're negotiating or the EU is negotiating with the Americans to fix high standards. So I think uh, we will, especially Germany being an expert nation, uh, number one, two, or three in the world, um, we will tremendously uh, uh, benefit from, from, from a free trade area. So I think, uh, and, and last thing, it is not a German-U.S. thing, it's an EU-U.S. thing. And I think it is, it is the most important transatlantic project of the past decades. And you're heading up the U.S.-Spain yeah, Council, right? Spain, yeah, Spanish-U.S. Council. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, go ahead. I was oh, just you. You know, how, what, well, how just two words. Uh, first on refugees, <coughs> uh, of course, now we have a hot issue, which is a concrete and very specific issue, especially in some, some countries. But uh, I lack and I feel that we should look at the causes, what has provoked this situation. And this brings me to some of the comments I, I made. No, this European Union is impossible as it is. And once again, multilateralism, uh, extraordinary bad foreign policy, etc., etc., has driven us uh, to make mistakes. I said Arab Spring, I said Ukraine, I said other things. And we have misread which was the situation in the Arab countries. So. We have to deal with the specific situation of all these people, of course, but more important than that is which is the capacity we have to analyze what has driven us to this situation, which are the causes. And this, once again, is not possible because differences are so big that I think a line of action in order to solve the origin of the problem, will, I will not see it. Second, of course, unemployment is the most important issue in, in Europe, I am of the ones that thinks that on the uh, risk scenario, we will never recover full employment as we understand it nowadays. So we must get used to another kind of employment or bring into the system a different way to employ people. And this is uh, disruptive, mm. but we have to think about this, these things. But what is very clear for the time being, and it's another, uh, concrete and a specific issue we are dealing with mm. is that unless we jump into these two tip negotiations as serious people, forget about transparency and all these uh, things uh, media like to have on this important, I've never negotiated in my life, mm. never ever negotiated an important deal with transparency. It's killing yourself. <laughs> so you, I mean, it's obvious, you are business people. You have to negotiate, and when you finish the negotiation, you have to pass it for approval. To tip, to tip, the negotiation with the United States in this very moment for you, the European Union is fundamental. Because behind the to tip, there is a geo uh, strategic 
and geopolitical issue, which is, do we go back to the Washington consensus? Do we make an effort to stay with the United States in the world, mm. which is not multilateral, in a bloc that really will give us the values of John Stuart mm. Mill or Hume or uh, all the people sure, which sure. have been in our base? Or do we go on to demonstrations feeling that uh, with uh, a lot of demagogy, may I say in English, around the tip? Because if we jump into the tip, not only it's a geostrategical move, but mm. the most benefited part of the economy are small and medium-sized companies, mm. by definition. These are the ones that are going to improve. And if SMEs improves, and this is the specific value of the tip with the United States, employment will improve. If we do not jump into the TTIP, and it looks like if we are not going to jump into it because we have these demonstrations and press and far left uh, positions and populist positions, we will miss another opportunity. Yeah. No way, no way yeah. with President yeah. Destruction. Just a comment on the word yeah. refugees was being bandied around. Just bear in mind that 80% of those who are coming to Germany aren't refugees at all. They are economic migrants. We've completely lost any sense of definition. I mean, you know, go back to Geneva. I've, I've seen different numbers, but uh, well, I, I think it depends well, on which numbers. I mean, the, I mean, the Slovakians say 90% aren't. The Eurostat figures, they, they, so the European Union's own statistical data centre tells you that 80% aren't. And, and we've forgotten what a refugee is. And I, I, I would be all for Britain doing as it's always done, helping genuine refugees. But Howard made the point very clearly, 642,000 people settled in Britain last year. Our appetite to take larger numbers of even genuine refugees has been diminished because of this. TTIP is very interesting. I'm oh, sorry, but sometimes we don't have a choice. You know, I mean, Oh, they, didn't, do. they didn't ask for things to happen in the Middle East like that, and you know, and and and, and yeah. you know, and again, we've we've all had to move or flee or migrate or something at some point. It just depends on how far back what you Juncker go in did. history. What Juncker did in April was to dust down the European Union's common asylum policy. I criticised it on the 29th of April. I said, if you go down this route, if you redraw the definition of what somebody qualifying for asylum is, I said there'll be an exodus of biblical proportions. And that's what we're beginning to see. So the don't Australians, you want to stay in the EU then still have a say in, the in, Australians, how, in how to negotiate this? We, have, we, have I mean, we, we didn't give up our borders to, Britain, to begin with. We, I mean, Britain, Schengen's there. We still have borders. Britain doesn't have a say. I mean, there are 40 times since David Cameron became Prime Minister that he's gone to the Council of Ministers and opposed something, and he's lost on all 40 occasions. So let's not pretend that Britain's listened to in Europe. It isn't. Um, but the border will be moved from Calais <coughs> to Dover if we opt out. Well, that's fine. We, I mean, we, we rely on the French on, on negotiating with the rest of Europe now. We don't have to take illegal immigrants if we don't want to. The Australians faced exactly the same crisis with people migrating from Southeast Asia by boat, all the same problems, criminal traffickers, boat sinking, people drowning, all the same things. And the Aussie, the Aussie Prime Minister said, very simple, he put notices up in all the countries they were coming from. If you come to Australia via this route, you will not be allowed to stay. And the boat stopped coming, and now the Australians are taking some genuine refugees and trying to deal with some of the problems back in those countries. So I think that needs But you sometimes don't have a choice how you leave your home. I mean, I was in Syria a while back, and, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, you, you don't have a choice how you leave. Well, you know, you sometimes you have to leave in well, the middle of the night with nothing, right? You just well, go. Well, no one, no, nobody's arguing that there aren't some genuine refugees who are fleeing in fear of their lives. What we are arguing is that on top of that, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are using this as an opportunity to be economic migrants and get to Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is not what should be happening here. And dare I say, on top of that, we have the ISIS threat. Uh, when ISIS say they will use this to flood Europe with their jihadists, we probably ought to take them seriously. Can I just say on a just more before, positive before note. Before you say that, we'll, we'll open up for. We'll open up. <laughs> just have a one positive, just, one positive note. I'd love maybe. a positive note. We'll open up for questions uh, just yes. after these comments. So we'll get your questions ready. Well, the only the positive note is, of course, uh, what actually the Germans are going to be doing and other North European countries is reflating. Everybody's actually asked Germany to spend more money. As a result of the refugee crisis, they're going to reflate and spend more money. So in the short term, the economic uh, performance of the Eurozone might be slightly better than uh, it would have otherwise been. And in the longer term, from bringing in people who 
eventually will be able to work, hopefully. The, the, the longer term depends on how well you integrate people into society and get them into the workforce. And that comes back to my point. If you make it too easy and they can just live off welfare, you've got a big problem. If you say sure. the welfare is not accessible, you've got to go to work, it's different. Peter. Yeah, uh, two things. First of all, I think it, it would be an illusion to think that we can uh, you know, fill in the gap of, of qualified <clears throat> workers in Germany that we need. Uh, no, but just by, by means of the refugees. I think it's a complete illusion. It's completely something that is out of the question. This is, this is uh, something that will not work. Second thing is, uh, just to get this right, to Nigel Farage, um, yes, uh, Merkel said uh, a couple of weeks back, you know, we can, we, are schaffen das. We, we can cope with the situation. She didn't ne never say, you know, everybody's welcome to come, but she, we, we are schaffen das. We, we, can, we, can, we can manage it. Which is a very bold statement to do, and w with the consequence that, that we saw afterwards. Um, and, uh, but it is, it, is, it is not right to say that that everybody can stay in Germany. We have, a, we, are, we, are, we have our immigration laws in place, but everybody can enter the country and you know, uh, has a right to, to, to you know, file for, 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 for a legal process. And at the end of it, it's determined, it's decided by, by the courts of law, you have to leave the country. That is where we have problems, that they actually have to leave the country because by that time they're already distributed all over the country. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you don't even know where they are. This is the, on the practical level, uh, uh, the problem. So we have the laws in place, we just need to apply them very strictly and then really we can't cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, very quick, very quick last comment and then we'll open to... Uh... As you wish, very quick. Uh, in, in, ten, in 10 years, in between 2002 and 2012, we received in Spain seven million immigrants, which is a kind of economic refugee, no? This means uh, we were 40 million, now we are 47 million. The lesson we have learned is that on the short term, this is a huge impact, more specifically an unemployment. Mm -hmm. But when you look at figures and you do perspective in terms of social security threats, pension threats, and the uh, population pyramid, Given the specific situation in Spain, most probably these seven million people will make sure a most, uh, a, a most brilliant future for our country. The price you have to pay on the short term is, is a high price. So just, do we have microphones out there now? Any questions? Yeah? Okay. Yes. I'm not sure who has the first. Is there a microphone somewhere? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, just, sorry, say who you are oh, and just who Andy, you're directing it to. I work for a family office. Um, Peter, if uh, Germany were Switzerland today, would you really want to join the, the EU? And um, do you think that Switzerland is isolated in the context of, uh, would, would that not be a good model for what the UK might look like outside of the EU? Well, I think Switzerland is doing pretty fine now, but, but as you know, they are, they are not <laughs> formally a member, they, they have agreed, they have signed so many tons of agreements uh, with the European Union, so they have a lot of the European uh, legal standards they already have in place, so there's a, a very close connection already in place. Uh, I don't know, know so much about Switzerland, I know a lot about, or I know more about some of the former Yugoslavian states like Ser Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro that I think, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, who are knocking on the door of the European Union and some are even not only have a candidate status, some are actually already negotiating, like Serbia and Montenegro, uh, with the European Union for membership. Uh, it's a tough way for them, and uh, we shouldn't make the mistake that we did with Bulgaria and Romania in earlier days, or maybe even with Greece, but I don't know, um, uh, in earlier days that, that, you know, that they were welcomed and they were uh, made a full member of the European Union without even meeting the standards, uh, legally, corruption and democracy and all these things that really causes problems now, also in the TTIP negotiations, by the way. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the EU, con the concept of the EU still seems to be very a very attractive concept and model for some of the countries out there that are, you know, our neighbor states. And, but again, I mean, we should, we should this enlargement process is, a is something that, uh, where we should not do the mistakes of the past. So, um, we have to take care, and it's, it's for the better of the countries and the people living in the countries themselves. Okay 
that they reach mm -hmm. the European standards, fight sure. against corruption, organized crime, and all these off. things before. Mm. Just to get to other questions as well, yeah. you look like you're bursting to say something Well, too. only that it's <laughs> obvious that if you're a much poorer neighboring state, you'd like to join the EU because you think there might be some fiscal transfers you can benefit from the credit rating of Germany to get cheaper money, potentially. What we're talking about, I think the, the, the gentleman asked the question, would the UK be better out, not would Serbia be better in? And so it's a different and it's a, <laughs> and it's a different economic equation. You might want the UK to stay for other political reasons, that's uh, an individual point. But from an economic standpoint, it's obvious that if you had the Swiss model, we could have many of the benefits without having so much of the downside. Okay. And that's, let's, I think, the central the point. Let's, let's get to some other questions. Just have to yell where the microphone is. We've got lots of questions over here, so yeah, please just... Uh, Gentlemen in the front, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, John Jones from, from Allen Bridge. Um, Howard talked about SME businesses and their concerns in the UK about red tape, and, and, the, and that frustrates economic growth. I mean, given all the problems in the EU with, with economic growth, are those concerns shared by SME businesses in Europe, or is this just, just a peculiarity to the UK? I think the truth of it is that the, that the EU is dominated by the big corporates. You know, the big corporates have their lobbying offices in Brussels. Uh, some of the commercial companies have 10 or 15 full-time lobbyists. They work and meet hand in glove. There are over 3,000 committees established at the European Commission, and they work with the European Commission to propose legislation. And we finished up with a model one of the reasons we've got so much legislation is because it is the big firms that are driving this legislation forward um, and the small companies have very little voice. I've certainly met delegations from the European Small Business Federation where these similar arguments are taking place in other parts of the continent. Uh, but it's interesting, when we talk about, Howard talked about small business and the amount of, of jobs that it creates in Britain. Interesting that, you know, only 15% of Britain's GDP is exports to the European Union. And yet being part of the regulated single market means 100% of our economy is regulated by those rules to seek 15% to seek of our business. And I think you know, the arguments, and they may sound a bit Reaganite, but the arguments that companies with fewer than 20 employees should be opted out of much of, that, of, of this stuff um, is one that I would like a post-EU Britain to put into place. Um, Let's get some more questions. Uh, I see we have four minutes left, so I ask your questions to be short and the answers to be short as well. Please, there's some more hands over here as well. Uh, you just pass them, yeah. Um, with so much uh, unemployment in Southern Europe, Spain, Portugal, Greece, where I come from, and even in France, um, let alone unemployment in Poland and in other Eastern European countries, uh, I don't understand the argument uh, that the Germany needs skilled workers and there is a shortage so they have to import all the refugees from Asia and Africa where southern Europeans have the highest rate of unemployment ever and they still cannot get to Germany enough. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I said earlier. I don't think that that, that, uh, uh, that it is the way to go to that, that we you know the, the, the shortage of skilled and qualified workers that we can fill in the gap with the refugees. Um, I know that there are several programs actually addressed to, uh, to, to the so-called periphery countries, to, to the, I mean, the, 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 the unemployment rate, uh, rate against, uh, amongst uh, youngsters in Spain is ex extremely high and there are government programs on the government to government level running to attract and actually attract young people in Spain and in other countries to come to Germany and there are a lot, I mean you see a lot of media coverage on this, a lot have come already yeah. to Germany so they have, they have this opportunity, sure. maybe it's not done, where well, Germany cannot solve the problems in Spain and other countries in Greece, yeah. but again, I mean there are programs uh, already in place okay. and I, I think quite successfully. The most positive experience we do have is for Spanish engineers or architects or doctors in medicine Etc. Etc. Moving into Germany. Germany is the country where, at this, uh, at the present moment, young people living in universities in Spain are more successful. And 100% of the feedback I do have from these people is, as I said, mm -hmm. very positive. Okay. Due to two reasons: how the government organizes it, 
and how the country uh, recognizes the value of these people. Let's get some more questions as well. Some more hands back here. Uh, hello, Alexander Ahari from Reddington. Um, question directed um, probably uh, to, to Mr. Farage. Um, I don't recall us um, signing up to the Americanization of our culture, our institutions, um, you know, the effectiveness of Trident. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts and opinions on the perceived lack of independence we have from the United States. Um, I'd also like to get your opinion on... Um, briefly. The, yes, very briefly, just very quickly. Um, <laughs> the corporate um, inability for us to uh, fund and maintain sovereign or strategic assets within the United Kingdom and the Im influence of institutions like Qatari DR um, and their procurement activities. Okay. In about a minute. <laughs> All right. Well, culturally, <laughs> I find much of the food my children want to eat and the television they programs they watch from America absolutely loathsome. I agree with you entirely. But there is nothing I can do about it because that's their freedom of choice to make those cultural decisions. Uh, the difference is this. What we've done, we've been signed... I know time is short. We've been signed up 40 years ago to something called a common market. We didn't realise that what it meant was we would lose the supremacy of our parliament, the supremacy of our courts, and the control of our borders. And what I'm arguing is for us to divorce ourselves amicably from political union and go back to being a normal country. OK. Do we have time for one last question? I think we do before lunch. One last question. Yeah, there's a woman in here as well. Should we do two? If we do like one minute. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ailish Murphy, and um, amongst many other things, I am a migrant. Um, my question is directed actually at Mr. Farage, who talked quite a lot about um, us not having voted to become part of this. We are now facing that vote. And if we do vote to stay within the European Union, what's his stance going to be going forward? Will he then look to reform? Well, we can try to reform, but it won't get us anywhere because what the word reform means to us, it means the complete opposite in Brussels. Reform in Brussels means deeper centralisation, the paradox that I talked about earlier. And last question right there in the middle. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne Kozins of SBD Global Fund. When we think about the future of Europe in financial terms, we often think about the future of Euro, which now became the world's second reserve currency. If European project is coming to an end, should be thinking about return to Deutschmark. Well, Deutschmark? Yeah. Anybody? I mean, I'd, I'd love to return to Deutschmark, because we're, we're German property owners, so that would be fantastic. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the irony is, actually, if you got the Deutschmark back, um, it would improve significantly the standard of living of the Germans in the short term. Of course, the export lobby would be uh, massively against it, but it's, it's, uh, the arguments in favour of a higher or a lower currency are never as simplistic. This idea that a cheap euro is necessarily good is, is not necessarily the case for the consumer, okay. certainly in the short term. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, lunch is waiting just before you go, just out of curiosity. How many of you think that uh, Merkel's way of dealing with the migrants or with the refugees, whatever you want to call them, um, was better than what Cameron did or worse? So how many would side with what Merkel did in terms of saying welcome? And how many would side with what, what Cameron did initially? which was more hesitant. Okay, so about 50-50 about in, in this room, no, I'd say, more or less? Yeah, more or less um, and also, I just ask you, just talk to each other or think about, as we head into lunch, uh, very last thing, if there's one word that, uh, that you could use to describe Europe, what would it be? And what would you want your children or your descendants to describe Europe as in 20 years? What would that one word what would you like them to use? What do you think they'll use about Europe in 20 years? Just something to think about as we head into lunch. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.